I was listening to Instagram wisdom, and I heard I, there, a preacher came across. I love religion, all of them. There is not a religion I don't love. There are some of the expressions of religion that I don't love, because really the essence of every religion is, wow, this thing hurts. Let's figure out how to make it better. Sometimes it goes against its own aim, let's be honest. But this preacher came across my Instagram, and he said one of the most misunderstood, misunderstood things about this idea of heaven is the idea that heaven is over there and that it's not about this idea of taking the infinite potential of reality and putting it within us and having it be that heaven is here, bringing heaven to earth. I think that's probably the best way to go as far as I can tell. I think the most important thing we can do is determine what narratives we want to listen to and, and write our own narratives and begin to create a story for ourselves. That's what you do after you melt it down. You begin to be the author of your life, to have authority over your life so that you have the power to say, because I said so. I'm happy despite those conditions because I say so. You'll hear me talk about unconditional freedom a lot. That is the signifier of unconditional freedom is when you get to determine how you respond to whatever stimuli you experience. I was born in the summer of love, so I collect stories. That's what I do. Many of them come from that time. That her heroic editor friend, she actually, when bad things happened, she was one of the people who had to tell me one of the bad things that happened, and that's that my agent at the time said I wouldn't touch her with a 10-foot pole, and she had to be the one to break the news to me. And, and she said, I just want you to know, you don't scare me, and I'm not going anywhere. That's what I mean. Benevolent aid comes. I didn't even know her. I didn't even know her at the time very well, you know. We just knew that we saw the same thing. We saw that there is a potential for joy to lead the joyous expression first of what women are with this radiance and this luminescence. So she was telling me this story because I, for about five years, have said, uh, when anybody says, oh, you should come back up, have said, uh, never, that will never, ever happen. And, you know, and she's really a sophisticated human being and very elegant Tibetan Buddhist practitioner. So when you speak to her, you really do feel like you're speaking to something majestic and incredible. And so I try to be on my best terms. That will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> and she would say, we'll see about that. We'll see. And so this thing was coming. She told me the story of this friend of hers in the summer of love. At the time, if there was a big rally in Washington that was aimed to speak against Vietnam. She's friends with this woman. So I want you to look at her because the story behind this is amazing. To me, that woman looks like a bastion of courage. You can almost even see light coming off of this woman, right? And so she told me this story. This woman is so profoundly intimate, right? And that image looks so courageous, like she's not scared at all. She's doing what needs to be done. But she describes it that she said, I was terrified. She said this had never been done before. She said, I didn't know if, as I faced the, the rifles, if I would be harmed. And she said, I had seen many people beaten and hurt. And she said, but I couldn't go against the calling that was in my heart. I had to, she, this is not exactly verbatim, by the way. I had to live by my principles even if it was dangerous. And she said, and you know what happened? She said, I went, my hand was shaking, and I put that flower in the rifle. Why this is so important to me is I think in that moment, a seed was planted on the planet. I think it hopefully will sprout soon. And the seed is that there's another way. There, in the face of that massive opposition that looks so powerful, this woman and a few others captured the attention of the American public with a flower. Now, what's important to understand here is that in every culture and most spiritual traditions, the flower is the symbol not only of the feminine, but of what exists between a woman's legs. That 
image gave me hope. And I can tell you that I look at it when I have fear about coming back out, that there is another way. There is another expression of power that is not aimed to overpower or disempower anyone. It's aimed to be the complement, to fill what's absent in the world. I think what we're experiencing is merely an absence of the feminine, that the feminine can subdue greed, hatred, and delusion. We aren't going to get through it by conquering it. It's not like her gun is going to outdo his guns. It's going to be by a different expression of power that's closer to gravity is a pretty profound sense of power. And what it does is just be gravity. And then it influences everything around it. So there's this amazing story Eli found of um, Marilyn Monroe, and this is an example of what I'm talking about. Marilyn Monroe worked with a photographer for a very long period of time, and they had a, an intimate friendship. And in that, they were walking down, I think it was Ninth Avenue here in New York, and Marilyn was wearing tennis shoes, she was wearing jeans. She was Norma Jean at this time, right? So she, she was very invisible. And they were walking, and then Norma Jean said to this woman, do you want to see Marilyn? Do you want to see her? And the woman said, you know, <laughs> okay. And all of a sudden, she lit up and she radiated. And when she did, throngs of people started coming toward her. Suddenly, they recognized the frequency. Same shoes, same jeans, same outfit, same hair, same face totally different expression. That's what we're here to bring. There's a movie called The Rose. I've seen it 30 times. So in the movie, Bette Midler plays Janis Joplin, loosely based on Janis Joplin. Bette Midler is playing The Rose and she's playing the artist. Here's Alan Bateman and he's the manager. And he's very concerned about money, very ah. Oh. And uh, so he says to her, Rose, please. Please, Rose, I'm just asking you one thing, just one thing. He's like sweating and stressed out. And she's there being the agreeable woman. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Rose, tonight the sponsors have asked just one thing. Just please don't use the word mother. Ha -ha. <laughs> and she's, uh-huh. Rose, no, I'm serious. No, just this one thing. Do not use the word mother. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So that you can feel, though, she's restless. She's restless to get on the stage. Because that's what she is. That's who she is. That's how she expresses, right? So she starts making her way to the stage. And you can kind of see her start doing that Marilyn Monroe moment. You can see the, the light coming from within. And then you see her move more quickly onto the stage. And then you see them hand her the bottles of Jack Daniels. And there's like, everyone's throwing roses onto the stage. And they're excited. And then you see her. And you see that moment where she can't. She just can't. She has to be who she is. Hey, I am mother. <laughs> <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. And everyone lights up. They all light up in the face of a woman being exactly who she is in her grand self, purely expressed. The lighters go. Everything's a little. I think I saw that movie too many times in sixth grade. 